Hello everyone, this is Pal Ponder on Weather. In this update, the tropics are really waking up as we're watching an area of disturbed weather down in the Caribbean that's gonna jump extremely heavy rainfall over the coming days. And that area will slowly drift north into next week that could spell trouble. Plus, we'll update you on the La Nina as we'll break everything down for you in this upcoming video. So good afternoon, everyone. This is your May 17th tropical update man i can't believe we're already talking about the tropics again but man the season starts around june the first and we're already talking about our first little disturbed weather down in, in the caribbean so if you do like weather related content uh please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to get all my daily updates to keep you ahead of the storm so let's get right to it uh, this afternoon let's take a look at the overall satellite picture and we're going to be watching this area of disturbed weather down here far extreme portions of the Caribbean. That's actually down here portions of Panama, down here into Costa Rica. That's gonna be dumping some extremely heavy rainfall. You can see the coast is pretty clear right now in the Gulf of Mexico. And right here in the central part, central part of the country, that's where we're gonna have all that severe weather taking place today into portions of Nebraska heading into Iowa here as they do have an enhanced risk for severe storms. But first, I wanted to update you on the overall La Nina. And it's not good, guys. This is the latest update from the Climate Prediction Center. This was actually put out last week. We've actually been in a La Nina. Technically, we've been in the La Nina since actually 2020, guys. So, and this is the latest update. And the La Nina looks to continue. In fact, it has a 58% chance it actually continues all the way through the summer months during peak hurricane season and then even extending past that going into fall into early winter we have a 61 percent chance that the la nina does continue all the way through the winter months so in the odds of el nino at this point right here in red it's basically four percent i mean it's almost just not going to happen guys i mean so the la nina is going to be staying with us or the foreseeable future, unfortunately. And let's take a look at this, because this is a kind of rare moment here. I mean, to actually can be considered a La Nina and just kind of break this thing down to you. It has to be at least a negative 0.05 uh, Celsius down here in the uh, equatorial Pacific. And you can actually see the last several years, I mean, essentially from 2020 in the bottom, left, uh, bottom corner of your screen, all these areas are below that 0.5 degrees celsius temperature so we've been at la nina and in fact it's been a while i mean it, you can you can see that some of the anomaly years uh this year that we're kind of highlighting that's favoring this upcoming pattern is right along 2011. so if we are going to be expecting to remain in a la nina we we were predominantly in la nina the entire year of 2011 and if you go all the way back to 1999 and all the way back into 2000, those years were also primarily, predominantly La Nina years. And this pattern definitely favors the analogs of, say, 1999, the year 2000, back in 2001, 2011 here. So when you had a strong La Nina like we are in now, uh, you have a lot less shear in, uh, out on the open waters of the Atlantic. We've had you know, back to back, very high, uh, you know, impact years for the United States. We had a lot of name storms. We actually went through the entire alphabet the last two years. And with the La Nina continued to remain in place, I expect that to that happened again. So I'm definitely expecting a very active hurricane season uh, in, in into this hurricane season ahead. So and it's just now kicking off. So in fact, the uh, the National Weather Service is just now starting to kick off advisories. They put out uh, starting in the middle of, middle of May, middle of May. But let's take a look at the waters. I mean, this is basically your classic La Nina, right here with all the colder waters here in the uh, Equatorial Pacific. And I can kind of circle this for you. Uh, this is what's basically classifying the La Nina right now. And look at all the cooler waters that we have along the coastline into the, off the, off the west coast. And notice this really warm blob. That's one of the reasons why we're setting up a, a very high impact uh, severe weather season as well as we get these multiple troughs is setting up off the west coast and they dive in and tap into the warm sector. We've got well above average, you know, Gulf of Mexico sea surface temperatures. So this is basically a, a classic La Nina uh, setting up and it doesn't bode well for a lot of the areas that we're currently 
and a drought and unfortunately that looks to continue really for the foreseeable future so let's take a look at the overall setup as far as when we typically have hurricanes and, and tropical storms uh, like i mentioned the season actually doesn't officially kick off until July, june 1st but the last seven years in fact we've had a named storm before june 1st and the last last year was around May the 22nd. So this is where it almost fits the same timeline as, hey, we're looking at some trop, some sort of tropical type entity trying to get its act together down here in the Caribbean. And it looks to maybe come to fruition again. So this is the area that we're gonna be highlighting in this uh, upcoming video. So yeah, let's take a look at the overall setup as far as, you know, what is typically La Nina, what is typically El Nino? Like I mentioned, we've been in an, in, a La Nina influenced pattern for the last two years. So basically what you've been seeing is what you're going to be getting for the next really five, six months uh, out there. And typically you have a lot uh, fewer hurricanes out here in the Pacific. I showed you all the colder waters out here in the Equatorial Pacific. And typically once you get past into the Atlantic side, you've got a lot of warmer waters out there that right now the Gulf of Mexico is extremely warm. Uh, the MDR region, the main development region, is not as favorable right now, but that's typically pretty common uh, this time of year as those waters try to heat up. But as they tap into these waters, you typically have a lot, 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 less, lot less shear in this particular environment. And it's almost just pretty much the opposite of what you're seeing with an El Nino. And the odds of that happening are essentially about 4% right now. So that's just not gonna happen. <laughs> so if we take a look at the ocean, uh, some of the deep ocean temperatures and where some of the, you know, kind of the warmest temperatures are in the Atlantic Basin, it's right here, pretty favorable in the Caribbean. So this is always an, uh, an area that we always typically look at and highlight this time of year for tropical storm, from some sort of tropical storm development down here in the Caribbean. And you can also see down here in the Gulf of Mexico, this is what's known as the loop eddy. Uh, this is also another favorable spot. If there's a storm that actually is able to go over this spot, then that might help influence the development and help kick up and, and help strengthen this uh, storm. Because uh, you know down here in the, is this uh, loop eddy current, these are these waters are typically a lot a little bit higher than elsewhere into the, into the Gulf of Mexico. But right now, let's take a look at the shear because that's one of the things that kind of inhibits uh, tropical storm development. But down here where we do have that disturbed weather down here in Central America, all these areas in green here, that's actually pretty favorable. So we're starting to look at this area really trying to get, get its act together. It's also known as what they call Central American uh, gyra uh, region. These take, these take a while to, to form, but once they start you know, getting a conglomerate of thunderstorms around them, that helps actually lower the pressures. And slowly over time, they try to get its act together and could form some sort of tropical uh, entity. And you can see actually definitely Further off into the on the Pacific side, there's also as another zone of a little bit more favorability. Once you head further north into northern uh, the Caribbean, especially into the Gulf of Mexico, it's not actually very favorable for tropical development currently uh, right now. But one of the things we take a look at is the vertical velocity index, and just kind of put this in layman's terms. If you look at the areas down here, up here, all these areas in blue, that's typically what you have, what they call upward rising motion air. You gotta have some sort of lift in the atmosphere to create uh, showers and thunderstorms. And right now, this is about May 17th timeframe, but this red area right here, that is your sinking air. It's not very favorable. So it's gonna be almost, almost impossible to get some sort of tropical development to form in that particular environment. And we're pretty much right there. So really the next five days, we're in that sinking air zone. It's not really a favorable time. But once you pass that, once we get past in say the 24th, 25th, 26th time frame, you start to get a lot more blues in in the picture. You get a bit more favorable conditions of upward rising motion air. And so now that's another favorable period and actually continues if you drop all the way down through the first part of June and through the middle of June. So we're actually going to be entering a little bit more favorable pattern once we passed and, you know, say five or six days from now, we're going to, be, we're going to have to be watching for the next really several weeks as we're going to be looking at a little bit more favorable pattern for tropical storm uh, development. For, but for the next five days, yeah, the National Hurricane Center started issuing advisories and yeah, where they have that sinking air, 
they're not really expecting tropical storm development in the next uh, five days to put you through now, essentially through, say, May 22nd time frame. But after that, I showed you, hey, we could be looking at a little bit more favorable development once we get past uh, that time frame. And that's one of the things that we're going to highlight, uh, because if you take a look at the overall EPS guidance, this is basically a conglomerate of the ensemble members of all the European model. And we've got a little bit more favorable conditions right here, down here in Central America, right along that day four or five zone. It could be a little bit more favorable as trying to get its act together, but it's pretty close to land. So it's going to be having a tough time to, tropi you know, to have some sort of a tropical storm development in that environment. But it's going to be dumping some extremely heavy rainfall, whether it forms into a storm or not. Because if we take a look at the overall precipital water index, all those areas in purple here, that is over three inches per hour down here in Panama, down here in the Costa Rica area. So we're talking extremely heavy rainfall is going to be pretty favorable really from about Thursday night through about Monday time frame. In fact, the National, National Weather Service has already highlighted those areas down here. These All these areas in yellow that you're talking heavy to extreme rainfall in places into Panama, places into Costa Rica, down here into San Jose, up here into you know places into uh, you know Nicaragua here, all the way up into El Salvador. These, these all these areas are going to be under the gun for an extremely heavy rainfall event. Uh, complements of that disturbed weather down there in the Central America. So really, from Thursday night to about Monday night time frame, from the 19th to the 23rd. Yeah, tropical storm or not, it's going to be dumping some extremely heavy rainfall. So flash flooding is a, a great concern down there. So if you live in that region, you've got friends and family in that region, definitely warn them on this uh, potential threat of very heavy rainfall is going to be on the table uh, really for the next uh, five days, really starting about Thursday night uh, time frame. But yeah, if you take a look at the latest uh, European guidance, I mean, some of these rainfall totals could be upwards to a foot, if not 18 inches uh, down here in this region. So it's we're pretty concerned about, uh, you know, for uh, excessive rainfall and deep uh, tropical moisture down in that region. But moving forward, yeah, this is the latest European guidance, the EPS guidance beyond that time frame, And it actually has, it's been favoring this piece of energy actually pushing over into the Pacific side. I showed you where, you know, most of the shear has taken place it's mo mainly in the Gulf of Mexico and the northern parts of the Caribbean, but there's not much shear further south and there's actually not much shear on the Pacific side. So it's actually gravitating towards that less shear environment and would pull some of this piece of energy back over to the open waters and on the Pacific side. But some of this, it's not out of the question, could actually transfer and sh shift over into the southern portions of the Bay of Campeche. So that's that's not uh, out of the realm of possibility uh, either. But if we take a look at the overall ensemble members, you know, con you know, kind of a, a summary of the ensemble members of the European model, we've got most of them. Yeah, most of the most of them shifted over into the open waters into the on the Pacific side. And it does have a, sh a few members actually shifting it further northward, entering parts of the Bay of Campeche, going into the in going into the Gulf of Mexico. But again, that won't be until around the you know the 25th, say 25th, 6th time frame. Really highlighting that same time frame where we have a lot of that upward rising motion air, where things could be a little bit more favorable uh, by then. But if we take a look at the GFS. Now that's actually a little bit more bullish and it has actually been a little bit more bullish with this particular system, but it's got actually more ensemble members, but this one's noticeably further off into the east and puts it pretty much more, you know, closer off into the Yucatan Peninsula. And it has more members actually favoring to cross over and into the Gulf of Mexico side around that same time frame, that 24, 25th, 26th time frame. Some of these, some of that uh, energy could be entering uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, by then. But if we take a look at the overall, you know, one one off models, this is the latest run of the GFS. And this has been again, it's been very bullish with this system. It's still a long ways out. But here's the latest run about the 25th time frame. This is still eight days. I showed you it's not favorable for the next five days. That's pretty much a given.
but you can see the discrepancy in between the two models of most of the energy of the U European model has it pushing well off into the Pacific side, some of it crossing over into uh, the, the southern half of the Bay of Campeche. The, the GFS guidance has it well, I didn't actually have it crossing over. It's actually got most of the ensemble members staying on the Atlantic side and then pushing towards the Yucatan and pushing some of its energy into the Gulf of Mexico. But again, that possibly won't be in there until you know the 25th, 26th timeframe. So this is just something, a, an area to watch at the moment. But one of the things that is gonna be inhibiting uh, storm development is the Saharan dust. We always look at this region, that's all this dust that's coming off of Africa and right around again, about the 22nd, 23rd, 24th timeframe, we've got a lot of, she we've got a lot of dust. So <laughs> you can see that the guidance from most of the European actually has it underneath and, and, and being on the Southern flank of this dust and it actually pushes it away from the dust and actually you know pushes the energy back into the pacific side if it, if it does ref does push some of that energy back into the bay of campeche it actually stays away from most of the dust that would come off the, the saharan region but the gfs it has it further you know further on this side further into the atlantic side and has it you know favoring entering more of that dust region which would actually inhibit uh, tropical storm development than actually kind of shear this, you know, shear, kind of a shear it apart as well. And it's got a lot of shear in the Gulf of Mexico currently, you know, as we speak. But if we take a look at the drought, so here's the latest drought and it's uh, not good, guys. I mean, a lot of this area has been dealing with the La Nina for the past uh, two years and uh, it's just been a while and it, it, it's not going to really help get, you know, get an improvement anytime soon. But all these areas in red, you're looking at extreme drought for portions of California, getting into Nevada here, much of New Mexico. That's where they've been having all the wildfires of lately. Down here in uh, West Texas, a lot of these areas are into an exceptional drought. It's really not until you cross over the you know, the east of the Rocky Mountains here where things start to get a little bit more favorable and where most of the systems have been as of late and looks to continue for the foreseeable future. But one of the things I wanted to point out if the European guidance is a little bit more correct, it'll actually will help in these areas down here in the South Texas would desperately need that rainfall really along the coast into the Louisiana as well and some of those areas are entering uh or in a drought criteria uh right now so let's take a look at this so here, here's the ensemble member guidance of some of the rainfall we could potentially look at for the next 15 days and again it's really kind of highlighting where that tropical type entity will end up uh, ultimately it pushing most of the guidance that most of the ensemble members of the european has those well above average precipitation down here in the Central America, crossing over on the Pacific side, and then having a piece of the energy pull further northward. And if that were to come for fruition, that would send actually some beneficial rains down here in deep South Texas, and really kind of along the coast here into Louisiana and portions of Mississippi here. Uh, but most of the guidance would push it well off into the Pacific side, and then have a little bit more drier conditions further you know, east into eastward into the Caribbean. If the GFS is correct, <laughs> it's got a little bit a little bit more favorable on the Atlantic side and pushes most of the energy and keeps it most of the energy into the Pacific side and not favoring really much of the of the on on the Pacific side here and not really favoring much of the Gulf of Mexico. So if the GFS is correct, then we would not be favorable for any type of drought conditions down here in Texas and Louisiana would push most of the energy out here into portions of the southeast as well as into Florida. So it's something that something that we have to watch for in the coming days. And this is the overall you know precipitation anomalies over the next uh, 15 days. So, hey, I appreciate you guys uh, watching. Do like this video. Definitely leave your comments below. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel to catch the latest update where I protect you before and after the storm.